Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering uh, the chapters 1, 2, and 3, which will be on exam 1. So we are going to be doing an exam review. Let's go ahead and get started with chapter 1. Remember, here we introduced some of those basic concepts of biology, which is the scientific study of life. Anytime you see a term in bold, make sure you, you know, learn that term. Uh, remember my eight checkmark method of studying? Try to implement that. Try to study uh, every slide, um, you know, multiple times. Try to study all the concepts. Don't just memorize, right? Try not to memorize, but try to actually understand the concepts. And uh, you know you can, you know you've understood the concepts when you can explain it to a friend. You could explain it to a family member even, or your cat if you don't, you know, or your pet goldfish. If you can explain the concepts to somebody and actually make make it logical, uh, then you know that you have learned that concept. Uh, remember that we touched on different uh, properties of life. So please know the properties of life order, regulation, or homeostasis reproduction, growth and development, right? Please know these properties of life because I might ask, you know, which of the following is not a typical property of life or a common property of life, something like that, right? So please know the, the, that these are properties of life. Remember the biological levels of organization? You should know these. So biosphere refers to the entire earth. You should know the definition of ecosystem. Remember what that means? The, not just the organisms, the different species that live in a particular environment, but also the environment itself, right? So the soil, the lakes, the, the, the climate, the air, the you know, streams, whatever, whatever the, the actual environment is, plus all the different species. That's an ecosystem. You should remember community. Remember that? community, all the different species that live in a particular environment, and then population. You should know the definition of population, and that is one particular species that lives in a particular place. Okay, emergent properties. You should know that life is an emergent property, and you should know what emergent property means. Remember that the cell is the smallest, smallest unit of organization that can uh, be, uh, you know, al alive. It can represent life, right? So you typically can't be simpler than a cell and be considered alive. You should know, obviously, the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Now, you should know that chromosomes are a single long double-stranded DNA molecule. And on those chromosomes are thousands of genes. So genes, they reside inside of the chromosomes and each chromosome contains hundreds or thousands of genes. And you should know what genes are. Genes are the units of inheritance. And you should know that genes code for proteins, right? Genes are the blueprints for proteins. Uh, not always, but almost, uh, you know, most of them. Most genes code for proteins. That's their main reason they exist. What else was there? Gene expression. You should know that gene expression is the process by which a gene, the blueprints, for a protein are then converted into a gene product, a gene product usually in the form of a protein. So the process by which you go from gene to protein, that's called gene expression. Okay, obviously know these terms. Now, remember we talked about life requiring energy and uh, transfer, transferring and transforming that energy Remember, you should know that producers in the ecosystem, they're the ones that can produce their own chemical energy. So these are the plants and the photosynthesizers. And then you should know that consumers, these are the ones that consume to obtain their energy. And these include the animals, right? 
And you should know this, remember this concept from chapter one, light enters the ecosystem and that's how energy enters the ecosystem. So if I ask, how does energy enter the ecosystem? It enters as mainly light from the sun. And then it's captured by what? Remember, it's captured by these photosynthesizers, the producers, right? And then the consumers, the consumers, uh, they consume those producers. So the animals, they eat the producers. The decomposers, they decompose dead matter. And, that's, and, then, and then how does energy leave the, the uh, ecosystem? That's right. Energy leaves the ecosystem as heat. So energy enters the ecosystem as light. Energy leaves the ecosystem as heat. So we need to know that for the exam. And we need to know what producers are, consumers, decomposers. All right. Remember that different organisms interact with one another? Okay. We touched on Darwin and evolution. We'll get to that. But do you remember this binomial nom nomenclature? So, for example, Homo sapiens is the binomial nomenclature for humans, right? And it's a two-word epithet with the first word, being the genus and remember the genus is capitalized that's why the h is capitalized the second word is the species and it's always supposed to be lowercase that's why the s is lowercase and then you should know this that at that point you have to either italicize the whole word you know the 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 name i should say uh or if you can't italicize, you know, then the next best thing is you need to underline it. But so you should know what proper binomial nomenclature looks like uh, and be able to pick out the correct binomial nomenclature. OK, and then look at the bottom. Remember the taxonomical hierarchy? We looked at domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So please know that in order. Know the taxonomical hierarchy from broad, which would be domain. And remember, there's only three domains of life, uh, all the way down to species, which is the most specific, right? That's, those are uh, members of a population that can interbreed and have fertile offspring. So know it in order. For example, I might say, what's next? Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, what's next? You know, and next would be family, right? So please know in order. And do you remember the trick I told you? My trick was dude for domain. King Philip came over for good spices, right? So that's my mnemonic device for remembering this list, right? Dude, King Philip came over for good spices. Uh, by remembering that silly phrase, it, re it reminds me of the correct order of the taxonomical hierarchy. Okay. Then you should know that there, again, are three domains of life, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. It's the bacteria and archaea, which are prokaryotic domains of life, and only the eukarya are eukaryotic domain of life. Okay, And remember, the domain eukarya, this includes all of the eukaryotic organisms. Those are the organisms with a proper nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, okay? And you should know this includes plants. This includes fungi. These, this includes animals. And it includes protists. And you should remember that protists are eukaryotes, and they're usually single-cell eukaryotes. Next, we talked about Charles Darwin's contribution to uh, science. We talked about on the origin of species by means of natural selection, where he kind of uh, made two main points, which are very important. Species showed evidence of descent with modification, and this was as a consequence of natural selection. Uh, and what you should know is his concept here. So what is descent with modification? This is what you need to know. 
descent with modification is a change in traits in a population over time. You can also think of it as a change in genes or allelic frequencies, they call it, a change in allelic frequency over time. Alleles are different versions of a gene. So for example, there's the white beetle color allele and then the dark beetle color allele, right? The alleles would be different versions of the gene. And notice how the frequency of those alleles has changed over time, right? The traits have, the, the percent of different traits has changed over time. That's what descent with modification means. And why did they change over time? Why did this population go from, you know, several white beetles to hardly any or none over time? Well, that's due to the so, uh, selective agent, right? In this case, natural selection is being con uh, provided by this selective agent, the sparrow. The sparrow comes in. The sparrow eats the lighter birds that it, I mean, the lighter beetles that it can see. And over time, that's what caused the descent with modification. So again, descent with modification is a change in allelic frequency over time, and it's caused by natural selection. In this case, the selective agent is a bird, but it could be anything. All right. Do you remember uh, the finches that were studied? as well uh, by Darwin. He studied various finches on the Galapagos Islands, and he noted that the beaks and the shape of the bird's head had to do with what they ate and which island they lived on, right? And this led to what he proposed was speciation. Then we talked about science a little bit, right? We should know that science is the knowledge about the universe and inquiry is a search for this explanations for these natural phenomena. We, we said something very important, right? You should remember this for sure. What is all biology starts with? All science begins with observation. So you should know that all biology, all science begins with observation. Very important to know, very important to know. And then we talked about data, right? And this is very simple, but you need to know it. The difference between qua qualitative data and quantitative data, right? Qualitative data is data that needs to be descriptive, right? It's, it, it's based on descriptions like these, um, you know, like, for example, this famous scientist, Jane Goodall, she studied primates for most of her life, right? And she's still studying primates. And much of her, you know, data was qualitative because they would she'd be noting their behavior right so behavior is something that you need to describe right so that's qualitative data whereas quantitative data is probably data is, is probably what you think of when you think of data it's like there's five of these or now it's 10 you know it's it's numerical measurements based on numbers okay and then the difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning you should remember that in inductive reasoning, you derive generalizations from a large number of specific observations, okay? Whereas in deductive reasoning, you use general premises to make specific predictions. So they are opposite types, right? One starts with specific and gets more broad. One starts with broad and gets more specific. So please know the difference between the two types Next, very important, know what a hypothesis is. Do you remember? A hypothesis is an explanation to a scientific question. It's based on observations and assumptions, and it needs to be testable. It needs to be testable. So you have to be able to do an experiment to test it, okay? And it needs to make predictions. So for example, I could give you different types different statements, different types of statements and ask you which one is the best hypothesis. You would look for an explanation. Uh, by the way, do explanations have a question mark at the end? No, the question has a question mark at the end. So hypotheses should not have a question mark at the end. They should be stated as an answer. They should be testable. You should be able to test them by doing an experiment 
right? So think about that. You need to know what, what a good hypothesis is. And the purpose of the experiment is to test the hypothesis. So remember this example, the desk lamp doesn't work. Why doesn't the desk lamp work? See, it has a question mark. Is that the, is that the hypothesis if it has a question mark? No, that's just your question. The hypothesis tries to answer your question. It's a possible explanation to your question, right? So hypothesis one is the bulb is burned out. Hypothesis two is the bulb is not screwed in properly. These are good hypotheses. What if there was a third hypothesis that said, you know, there's evil spirits or there's just a hex, there's a hex on the, on the lamp, then that would not be a good hypothesis. Even though it's stated properly, it's not testable with an experiment, right? So remember that. Okay, then um, we talked about a control experiment. Um, we talked about, oh, this is important. Independent variable versus dependent variable. Very important. The independent variable of an experiment is the one that is manipulated by the researchers. So for example, in the light bulb one, if, if we're testing that the bulb is burned out, then the independent variable would be me putting in a brand new light bulb. Does that make sense? Because that's what I did. Now, the dependent variable is the one predicted to be affected in response. So in, in response to me putting in a brand new bulb, I would predict it should work, right? But I don't know for sure if it's going to work. So when I try the switch again, if it turns on, that's my, that's my data. That's that's my dependent variable. Did it turn on or not, right? That's the dependent variable. So again, the independent variable is what the researcher manipulates. The dependent variable is what you're trying to measure, what you're trying to see as a response. And then this is something very important as well, a theory. So you should know this, a scientific theory, when, when there's a theory in the scope of science, this is broader in scope than a hypothesis. This is supported by a large body of evidence, right? So it's basically a tested and confirmed concept or tested and confirmed hypothesis. Okay. And then we ended that chapter. So awesome, you guys. Let's um, take a quick break time, this time with just Wicked. Let's see what little Wicked's up to right now. Let's take a break time. We'll be right back for chapter two. All right, welcome back from break time with Just Wicket. Um, let's go ahead and start with chapter two. This is chemistry, a review of chemistry. Obviously, know what matter means, what is an element, what is a compound. You should know that compounds have different properties than the composite elements that make them up. So sodium chloride, for instance, is a compound and it has completely different properties than the, you know, chlorine and the sodium that make it up. And that is an emergent property. The compounds have those types of emergent properties. Next, you should definitely know that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are the four elements that make up 96% of living matter. Uh, this is very important to know that these four are the big four. These four make up 96% of living matter, okay? And then you have the remaining 4%, which consists of a few handful of elements, as well as a bunch of trace elements, trace elements which you need in minute quantities. You should know, obviously, what an atom is, neutrons, protons, electrons, their charges. The atomic nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons and electrons. Uh, they, they exist in the orbitals outside of the atomic nucleus. You should know what a Dalton is. It's a measure of mass. And you should know that it's the protons and the neutrons that, that have a mass of one Dalton. Electrons have, are so 
tiny that they are about 2,000 times smaller than adultin, right? So it's protons and neutrons that have a mass of adultin, not the electrons. All right, well, you should know that the atomic number is very important. It's the number of protons in an element, and it identifies the element. You should know that the mass number is the sum of the protons plus the neutrons. Um, if I were to give you a chemical symbol, you should be able to tell me how many protons the element has, how many neutrons the element has, and even how many electrons the element has. Because remember, the elements as they appear on the periodic table of elements should be neutral, which means they should have the same number of protons as they do electrons. So whatever their atomic number is, that's the number of electrons as well in an atom because atoms by definition have the same number of protons and electrons. And then you should know what an isotope is. Remember an isotope? You have different numbers of neutrons, but for the same element. Next, we talked about energy. And we talked about the energy electron shells of an atom. You should know that the further the shell you're, you're looking at, so here you're looking at the third shell of this atom, the third shell would be the highest energy shell. Whereas the first shell for this atom, the first shell has the lowest energy level. So energy level increases as you go out in shell. Okay, next you should know that the first row on the periodic table has, these are elements with one total shell the second row, these are elements with two shells. The third row, these are elements with three shells. And then the columns represent how many valence electrons each element has. And do you remember something very important I mentioned before? That it's the valence electrons that give a chemical its properties. So if I were to ask you, what is the most important aspect or important part of an atom to, di to dictate its chemical properties? Um, you would say not the protons, not the neutrons. It's the valence electrons that give chemicals their chemical properties. And then remember, it takes two electrons to fill the first shell because the first shell only has one orbital and each orbital can only house two electrons. The second shell can house eight electrons because it has four orbitals. Remember, a big sphere and three dumbbells. And then the third shell has a further eight more electrons because it has four more orbitals. Okay. Again, an orbital is a three-dimensional space where an electron spends you know, more than 90% of its time. And remember, only two electrons can inhabit any one orbital. All right, then we talked about chemical bonds, and we started with covalent bonds. So for instance, I might ask you, which of the following, you know, is not a, um, a feature of a co covalent bond, is not associated with covalent bonds, right? So in that case, you would need to know what a covalent bond is in order to know what a covalent bond isn't, if that makes any sense. So uh, do you remember a covalent bond is a strong bond, right? It is a very strong bond. It involves sharing of electrons. If you share one electron with a neighbor, then it's a single covalent bond. If you share two electrons with a neighbor, that's a double covalent bond. And if you share three electrons with a neighbor. That's a triple covalent bond. Um, remember that covalent bonds could can be polar covalent bonds or nonpolar covalent bonds. That's a thing as well. Anytime an element shares electrons with itself, so oxygen 
sharing with itself to form oxygen gas or hydrogen sharing with itself to form hydrogen gas, this will result in even sharing because the if you're sharing with yourself like two hydrogens or you're sharing with yourself like two oxygens, then this is going to result in a nonpolar covalent bond because the sharing is going to be even and anytime the sharing is even in a covalent bond because the two partners are equally electronegative, equally greedy, then this is going to result in a nonpolar covalent bond and it is going to result in a nonpolar molecule. Okay, uh, let's see, what else? Electronegativity. Remember this term is very important. Electronegativity is an atom's attraction for the electrons in a covalent bond. Again, um, different elements have different electronegativity associated with them. Do you remember that table? I'm going to pop it up. Uh, the table, uh, uh, periodic table of elements. Remember these arrows? Pay special attention to these arrows. Look, as you look to the right and as you look up on the periodic table, the uh, electronegativity of those elements is higher and higher and higher. So oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, you know, these are elements with very high electronegativity, whereas at the bottom left there, you got francium, the, the whole first column there on the periodic table uh, are, are not very electronegative at all. In fact, they like to let go of their electrons, right? So you should know that. And do you remember the one exception I needed you to remember? Do you remember that from before? That's right, that hydrogen should belong right up on top of carbon in terms of its electronegativity because I need you to remember that hydrogen and carbon have the same electronegativity, roughly the same. And that means anytime you see carbon forming a covalent bond with hydrogen, the electrons are going to be shared evenly. And this is going to result in a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, When you see carbon and hydrogen sharing, you should think even Steven sharing, right? No polar covalent bond, not going to make a polar molecule. It's going to be a non-polar type of uh, situation, okay? So just remember that very, very important stuff, right? So again, non-polar covalent bonds are formed between atoms that share electrons equally. This happens anytime you share with yourself. So for example, H2, O2, N2. Those are all going to share equally, so those are nonpolar gases, right? Uh, methane, CH4. What do you think of methane, CH4? Well, that's also going to be a bunch of nonpolar covalent bonds, right? Because I told you C and H, they, sh they always share evenly, okay? And then what about polar covalent bonds? This is when one atom is more electronegative than another. So the atoms are not going to share evenly, right? They're not going to share uh, very equally. So, for example, oxygen sharing with two hydrogens to form water. Remember that? Oxygen and water sharing. Um, remember that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so even though they should be sharing these electrons evenly, the oxygen is pulling those electrons closer to it. Remember that electrons have a negative charge associated with them. So imagine the electrons which are negatively charged are spending a lot of time with oxygen that's going to leave oxygen oxygen with a partial negative charge does that make sense the negatively charged electrons spend more time with oxygen oxygen forms a partial negative charge and that leaves the hydrogen remember hydrogen has a proton in it right it has a proton but it's electrons away over here you know messing about with oxygen. So its proton is left over with more of a positive charge. You know, it, it needs that electron closer for it to be fully neutral, but its electron is spending too much time with the oxygen, leaving the proton behind to be partially positive. Does that make sense? So I might ask you on the exam, I might ask you, you know, about water and why water is polar 
Gizmo, don't give that away. <laughs> uh, okay, Gizmo may have got given something away. But listen, um, I may ask you why water is polar, right? So can you explain why water is polar? So for example, uh, why is water polar? Well, water's polar because, you know, I see partial charges here. I see a partial plus charge. I see a partial negative charge. Okay, why? Why are there partial charges on this polar molecule? Uh, well, because the electrons are not being shared evenly. The electrons are spending too much time with oxygen. Uh, and, and so what does that mean? That means it's a polar covalent bond is forming between oxygen and hydrogen. So why? Why does a polar covalent bond form between oxygen and hydrogen? Well, it's because although they are sharing electrons, oxygen is more electronegative because it's further to the right on the periodic table of elements. And so because it's more electronegative, that means it doesn't share, um, you know, it's not going to share uh, evenly with with uh, like something like a hydrogen, which is less electronegative, and so it's going to draw those electrons closer to it, right? So this is now we understand how electronegativity plays a role in polar molecules, right? Electronegativity explains why water is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative; it has a higher affinity for electrons. It draws those electrons close. Hydrogen has a lower electronegativity, closer to that of carbon. And so hydrogen's electrons, you know, are drawn closer to the oxygen. The electrons have a partial, or, or the electrons have a negative charge, and they're spending more time with oxygen, leaving oxygen with a partial negative charge. The hydrogens are left with a partial positive charge, right? So please be able to explain to me why water is a polar molecule exactly why not just superficial but go into detail of why water is a polar molecule okay and next we talked about ions remember when you see what so when you see this little greek delta when you see this little d, d delta um that means partial so so never never if you're talking about water which is a polar molecule you shouldn't write just a negative charge. That's wrong, right? You need to put the partial here. This is this shows you that it's a partial negative charge. However, if I just had a negative charge, that would be an ion, right? So remember Na plus or Cl minus for, for salt, right? Those are ions because I don't see a little partial charge, right? Ions have a plus or a minus charge of some kind. And if it's a plus ion, it's a cation. Remember cats are positive things. And if it's a minus charge, that's an anion. And the, the bond that forms between a cation and an anion is called an ionic bond. So here you see sodium atom, when it meets chlorine atom, sodium releases its electron. Sodium, because sodium, remember, sodium is not electronegative at all. It's on the first column on the periodic table. These guys are have the lowest electronegativity. Chlorine has some of the highest electronegativity. So chlorine loves to steal electrons from things. And so chlorine actually ends up stealing the electron from sodium. And so because they're not sharing, they're not sharing there, the sodium's going to lose its electron completely. See, no partial plus, just a plus. And chlorine is going to gain that electron completely. See how there's, there's no partial, no minus here. And now sodium has formed what's called sodium cation, and chlorine has formed what's called chloride anion. And because they are oppositely charged, okay, because it's a plus meeting a minus, they stick together, a bond known as a ionic bond. And do you remember the other term I wanted you to learn? Uh, this might be on the test. Um, so remember I told you two important terms, oxidation and reduction. Okay, these are important terms because oxidation means to lose an electron and reduction means to gain an electron. So if I were to ask you, is sodium becoming oxidized or reduced in this reaction? 
what would you say? You would say oxidized. Sodium is oxidized. It's losing its electron. That means that chlorine is becoming reduced. It is gaining the electron. And do you remember my shortcut way of remembering that? Leo says grr, right? Like lions say grr. Loss of electron means oxidized. So whoever's losing the electron is getting oxidized, like sodium here. And gain of electron is reduced. So whoever's gaining the electron is reduced, like chlorine here. Okay, so hopefully that helps you remember oxidized and reduced. And this forms salts, right? Salts. And do you remember something important I told you? Um, anytime column one, uh, let me get back to the periodic table here. Anytime column one interacts with column seven on the periodic table, this forms a salt. So sodium chloride is a salt. Sodium fluoride is a salt. Um, lithium chloride is a salt. So these are all salts. So potassium is usually over here below sodium. Potassium chloride is a salt. So anytime column one meets column seven, it forms a salt. That's kind of good to know. Now, moving on to weak chemical bonds. Remember the main weak bond we talked about that I want you to remember is the hydrogen bond where there's a weak, sticky interaction between two polar molecules. So here you have water, the polar molecule water, and below it you have the polar molecule ammonia. How do I know it's polar? Well, there, I see partial charges, so it's a polar molecule. And I know that nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen because it's to the right of hydrogen on the periodic table of elements, even though hydrogen's right above carbon. Um, ammonia is a polar molecule. Water is a polar molecule. So when one polar molecule meets another polar molecule, look what happens. The partial positive end of one water molecule likes to stick to the partial negative end on the ammonia molecule. You see opposites attract, right? So the partial positive end of this molecule sticks to the partial negative end on this other molecule, this, this ammonia molecule. And that weak little sticky interaction, which is very easy to make and break, it's not very strong at all, um, is denoted by a dotted line. When you see a dotted line like this in a series, that means it's a hydrogen bond. It's a very weak little sticky interaction between polar molecules. All right. Next, finally, we talked about chemical reactions. Remember on the left of the arrow, when you see a chemical reaction on the left of the arrow is what you start with. This, these are the reactants. And on the right of the arrow, this is what you end up with after the reaction takes place. And these are known as the products. And if you see two arrows going in opposite directions that are equally long, that means that you have reached equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, when the forward and the reverse reactions are occurring at the same rate. Awesome, you guys. So last time we did a quick break time to see what Wiki was up to. Well, why don't we do a break time this time and see what that little gizmo's up to. I know I saw him around here somewhere, so let's go find him, and we'll be right back with Chapter 3. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo this time. Uh, let's carry on with our final chapter for the first exam, chapter three, water and life. Let's do it. Um, do you remember that water is, you know, polar because it has polar covalent bonds? We just touched on that in chapter two. So water is a polar molecule. This allows water molecules to interact with one another with what type of bonds you see these little tiny dots what type of bonds are those that's right wicket <laughs> hydrogen bonds right hydrogen bonds you've got hydrogen bonds forming between water molecules so what you could say is that water molecules stick to other water molecules and this is called 
cohesion. Remember that term, cohesion. Water molecules sticking to other water molecules. And remember, it's the partial negative end of one water molecule, which sticks to the partial positive ends of the other water molecule. And cohesion is responsible for surface tension, a measure of how difficult it is to stretch or break the surface of a liquid. Adhesion, you should know, adhesion is water sticking to other substances, right? So, for example, if water sticks to glass or water sticks to plant cell walls, this is adhesion. And the combination of cohesion and adhesion is what allows plants and trees to draw water up from the roots all the way up to the top parts of the tree. And that the, the reason that they keep moving is because at the tips, at the leaves, evaporation occurs. And when that evaporation occurs, that frees up more space for more water to crawl up the tree. Now, remember that water is amazing at absorbing heat from warmer air and then releasing stored heat to cooler air. Remember the types of energy we touched on? Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. A type of kinetic energy is thermal energy, which is kinetic energy of atoms or molecules. Temperature, remember temperature represents the average kinetic energy of molecules in a body of matter. And heat, heat, thermal energy in transfer from one body of matter to another is defined as heat. A calorie, remember, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree C. So, so a calorie is the specific heat of water. Specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to change its temperature by one degree C. And what you should know is not only is one calorie the specific heat of water, but that is a particularly high specific heat. Um, one calorie is quite a bit of uh, energy. Then what did we need to know? Heat is absorbed by water when hydrogen bonds break. And then heat is released by water when the hydrogen bonds form. So remember, I showed you the coastline of Southern California here. And the reason why the coast is so nice and cool, whereas inland near Palm Springs or San Bernardino might be hot at the same time, is because of what we just discussed. Water can absorb an immense amount of heat by breaking its hydrogen bonds without changing its own temperature by very much at all. And then at night when it's cool, those hydrogen bonds reform and the ocean itself can release that stored heat, making sure that the coast does not become too cool either. Now, what is this term heat of vaporization? Is the heat a liquid must absorb for one gram to be converted to gas? And do you remember what we mentioned in chapter three, that when water evaporates off of a surface, the remaining surface cools, right? So this is called evaporative cooling. Remember, remember when we mentioned that in chapter three, that the reason you sweat and sweat seems to cool you down isn't because you become wet when you sweat, but because that sweat evaporates off of your skin. And due to evaporative cooling, that sweat that evaporates takes a lot of uh, heat with it. It takes, the, it takes heat off of your skin, leaving your skin quite cool, right? So it's the evaporation of sweat off of your skin that cools you, not necessarily the sweating itself. Okay, and then do you remember we talked about the density of water versus ice? When water freezes into its solid state, which is ice, it forms a crystalline lattice, like a crystal, an ice crystal, and the water molecules spread out. Do you remember that? When, 
when ice freezes when when water freezes into ice those water molecules spread out to form that crystalline lattice and this is a 10% less dense than liquid water in fact liquid water is reaches its greatest density at 4 degrees C this is right before it freezes so what you need to know is that ice is less dense than water and this is why ice floats on top of water and what allows life to be possible on earth because if if ice sank pretty soon the oceans would freeze over and life wouldn't be possible in the oceans all right next we discussed the retreating uh, Arctic ice sheets and how this can have an effect on local animals. We discussed the terms solution, solvent, solute, and aqueous solution. So let's touch on this one more time. A solvent is a substance that can dissolve, right? It, it's a dissolving agent. So for example, water is known as a good solvent. It's good at dissolving things. So water is a solvent. Whatever you dissolve in the solvent is the solute. So for instance, you can dissolve salt in water. You can dissolve sugar in water. So those things are the solutes. And the combination of the solvent and the solute form a solution. They form a solution. A solution is a liquid that is completely homogeneous mixture of substances. All right, so, and if water is the solvent, this is known as an aqueous solution. And the cell is an aqueous environment. And do you remember one more thing? Um, do, you see, do you see how water is dissolving sodium chloride? This is a sodium chloride crystal on the right. Um, do you see how water is dissolving the sodium chloride? You see, water has a partial negative charge on the oxygen, and it has a partial positive charge on its hydrogens. So I want you to pay special attention here. Look at this. Notice how it's the oxygens of these waters, the red oxygen, that's forming hydrogen bonds with this sodium cation. Notice this. This is known as a hydration shell. Remember that? That water can surround a solute. When water surrounds a solute like this by forming hydrogen bonds with a substance, that's how water pulls a substance into solution. So you could say that the reason why sodium chloride is dissolved in water is because water forms these hydration shells around it. And I want to ask you this. Does it make sense that the artist drew the red oxygen part of the water molecules interacting with the sodium? Does that make sense? Because remember, let me ask you this. Um, let me ask you this. The, the oxygen, what partial charge does the oxygen have? Okay, that's right. It has a partial negative charge, a partial negative charge. So would a partial negative charge want to stick to sodium cation, which has a plus charge? The answer is yes, right? So it makes sense that water would stick to this positively charged cation. Well, let's look at the chloride, the anion, right? Look at this. Chloride is an anion, negatively charged ion. Look at the water. Look how it's different, right? It's not the red part that's sticking to chloride, is it? It's the gray part. The gray part is the hydrogens. And what charge do the hydrogens have? That's right. They, they possess a partial positive charge, right? The, the little Greek letter D, right? Partial uh, positive charge, a partial positive charge. So does it make sense that water molecules would be sticking to this negative entity with their slightly positive hydrogens? That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's the partial positive hydrogens that stick to the negatively charged anion. And they form what? They form a hydration shell.
and that's what pulls chloride into solution. So, so this is important to understand, isn't it? When a molecule has charges on it, when a molecule has charges on it, um, water can stick to that molecule and form hydration shells around that molecule or ion, you know, uh, as long as water can stick to an ion or a molecule, water can form a hydration shell around that substance and water can pull that substance into solution. Okay. So what you need to know, okay, this is very important for the exam. What you need to know is I might ask you what types of substances can water dissolve, right? What kinds of substances uh, can dissolve in water? Is water a good solvent for? Well, how about ionic substances? Look, can ions dissolve in water like sodium cation or chloride anion or salt, right? Sodium chloride. Can ions dissolve in water? Definitely, right? Because water sticks to ions, doesn't it? If it's a positively charged ion like sodium cation, the partially negatively charged oxygens of water will stick to that. If it's a negative charge like chloride, the anion, then the hydrogens will stick to that, right? What else can dissolve in water? Just Not just ions, right? What else can dissolve in water? Well, let me show you this one. All right, this is the old example from chapter two I wanted to show you. Remember this? Look at this molecule down here, ammonia, NH3. Remember I told you ammonia is a polar substance. It has a partial negative uh, charge on the nitrogen, partial positive charge on the hydrogens. Do you remember that? Well, let me ask you this. Can water stick to ammonia? Yeah, look at this. Um, the hydrogens would love to stick to the partially negatively charged nitrogen of ammonia. And guess what? If there were water molecules down here at the bottom, those water molecules would stick to the hydrogens, right, of the ammonia, right? What part, what part of the water would stick to these hydrogens down here at the bottom? That's right, the partial negative oxygen, right? The partial negative oxygen of the water would stick here. So let me ask you this. Do you think that water can stick to and form hydration shells around polar substances like ammonia? That's right, Wicket. <laughs> um, yes, the answer is yes, right? So polar molecules such as ammonia dissolve in water, right? Because water molecules can stick to them, right, with the hydrogen bonds and form little hydration shells around them and bring them into solution. So, so again, do you think polar molecules such as ammonia dissolve in water? Yes, exactly right. They do. They do. Now, briefly, let me ask you this. Do you remember this molecule right here? Look at this molecule right here. What was this? CH4. That was methane, right? Methane. And do you recall if this was a polar molecule, an ion, or a nonpolar molecule? It was nonpolar, right? Do you remember why? It was because the carbon and the hydrogen have the same what? The same electronegativity, okay? So carbon and hydrogen have the same electronegativity. So even though they're forming covalent bonds here, those are nonpolar covalent bonds because of the even sharing. So are there any partial charges that should develop anywhere on the carbon or these hydrogens of methane? That's right. The answer is no. There's, there's no partial charges. There's no full charges. There's no charge. It's all perfectly neutral. So methane is a perfectly neutral nonpolar molecule, right? So let me ask you this now. Remember water right here, water? Remember that water's oxygen has a partial negative charge. Water's hydrogens have a partial positive charge. Let me ask you, what part of water would stick to, uh, to um, methane here? What part of water sticks to methane? Would the 
partially negatively charged oxygen want to stick to any part of methane? No, because the, the oxygen wants to stick to anything that's positively charged in any way. What about the partially positively charged hydrogens? Would they stick to methane? No, they wouldn't, right? Because these hydrogens have a partial positive charge, so they're looking for anything with any kind of negative charge to stick to. So, th so if that's true, what part of water, what part of water would stick to methane? Well, no part, right? No part of water. No part of water, right? So that's fantastic. Hopefully you understand that. Um, water will not stick to any part of methane because methane has no charges of any kind. And that's because it forms nonpolar covalent bonds. That's because hydrogen and carbon have the same electronegativity. So they form uh, nonpolar covalent bonds. So everyone's sharing the electrons evenly. And anytime in covalent bonds you're sharing electrons evenly, no charges form anywhere. It just stays perfectly neutral, right? So so if I asked you this, let me ask you this. What types of molecules will water not dissolve? Not is not a good solvent for. That's right. It would be nonpolar molecules such as methane, right? So think about that. Anytime you have molecules made of carbon and hydrogen, you have you have a molecule made up of just all hydrogens and carbons. Would you think those big molecules made up of hydrogens and carbons would mix with with water? Do you think if you have big molecules just just made up of carbon and hydrogen, what what could you tell me about those molecules? Let's say you had a big molecule, a huge molecule made up of many carbons and many hydrogens. Do you think that would be a polar molecule, an ionic compound, or would it be a nonpolar molecule? That would be a nonpolar molecule, exactly, because when, whenever you see just carbons and hydrogens, you should know that they're, they have the same electronegativity. So if they're, make, if they're bonding together, everything's even, Stephen. Everyone's sharing electrons evenly, and so these are big nonpolar molecules. And the reason I point that out is because things that you know don't mix with water, like oil, fat, grease, wax, these types of things, these things are basically just large molecules made mainly of carbon and hydrogen. Isn't that neat? So now you know why oil and water don't mix. Now you know why wax and water don't mix. These substances are nonpolar. They are comprised almost entirely of carbon and hydrogen. Therefore, there's no polar bonds forming. There's no polar partial charges anywhere. There's no full charges anywhere. There's nothing for the water to stick to. And do you remember when water cannot stick to a molecule or a compound, water's not going to dissolve that molecule or that compound. So hopefully that makes sense. You know, that's a big important point. It's going to help you not just in biology, but it's going to help you when you move on to chemistry, when you move on to biochemistry, when you go on to other classes. This, these concepts do play a role, right? Now look at this, even large polar molecules such as proteins can dissolve in water as long as they have either ionic uh, charges on the surface, so plus charges, minus charges on the surface, or as long as they have polar regions like partial charges somewhere. So look at this giant protein. You see this big old, this big old purple protein? That's one big protein. And that protein can actually dissolve in water because look at all the water molecules sticking to the protein, forming a hydration shell around the protein. And if we zoom in real close here, um, I'm sorry, here on the, on the right, look at this. If we zoom in real close onto the surface of that protein, you'll notice that the surface of the protein has partial charges. It might have full charges. And look, that's, that's just inviting these water molecules to stick. The, the hydrogen of a water molecule will stick to any negative portion of the protein, and the oxygen of another water molecule will stick to any positive charges on the surface of the protein. Isn't that neat? Okay. And by the way, anything that can mix with water and be dissolved in water is known as a hydrophilic substance. So, 
So what would you say are hydrophilic substances? Well, I would say anything ionic, right? Cations, anions, uh, ionic compounds, right? Or what? Or polar. Anything polar is hydrophilic, right? Uh, so what's hydrophobic? Hydrophobic is any substance that will not mix with water, that does not have an affinity for water. So how about methane, right? Uh, anything... How about oil? How about fat? How about wax? Right? These are hydrophobic. Why? Because they do not have any kind of charges. They are nonpolar molecules with nonpolar covalent bonds. Do you remember these terms here? Molecular mass, the sum of all masses, a mole. A mole is Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23. We talked about molarity, which is the number of moles per of solute per liter of solution. Do you remember when we talked about how water can break apart into ions? Remember that? Uh, water can ionize when we talked about pH. That was an important part of chapter 3. Um, Remember, water can break apart into hydrogen ion, H+, plus, which is the same as what? What's, what's another term for hydrogen ion or H+. Plus? That's right. That means a proton. And what else, does, what else do, is produced? When water breaks apart, it forms a hydrogen ion, but it also forms OH-, minus, right? A hydroxide ion. And did you remember that only at neutral pH 7 are the concentration of protons and the concentration of hydroxide ions equal? When, when something is acidic, remember, if, if a solution is acidic, it has a high concentration of protons. If a... If a uh, uh, a, a solution is basic or alkaline, it has a very low concentration of protons. An acid is a substance that increases the proton concentration of a solution, while a base is a substance that reduces the proton concentration of the solution. Acids have pH less than 7, so so acids are pH 1, 2, 3, uh, you know, and such. Bases have pH higher than 7, so 12, 13, 14. These are bases. Okay, and did you remember the other thing I needed you to know? How the pH scale works? Okay, what I, what I might ask you, you know, I might ask you on the exam is something like this. So think about this. At pH 4, for instance, at pH 4, at pH 4, you have how many times more protons than you did at pH 7? Okay, again, at pH 4, you have how many times more proton concentration than an equal uh, volume solution at pH 7? Well, let's think about this. Remember, each step is what? So from, from 7 to 6, what's happening to your proton concentration? Remember from chapter 3. If you don't recall this, watch the video for chapter 3 where we talk about pH on the board. When you go from pH 7 to pH 6, that's 10 times the proton concentration, right? So pH 6 has 10 times the proton concentration of pH 7. And then when you go from pH 6 to pH 5, that's another 10 times the proton concentration. And from pH 5 to pH 4, that's another 10 times the proton concentration. So, so what would be the answer? Well, from, from pH 7 to pH 4, you have 10 times 10 times 10. Okay, that's how you answer it. So what's 10 times 10 times 10? That's 1,000, isn't it? So the correct answer is at pH 4, you have a thousand times the proton concentration than an equal volume solution at pH 7, right? Then at pH 7. Now, what if I asked you this? What if I asked you this? What if I said, well, what about the hydroxide ion concentration at pH 4, right? What 
what about the hydroxide ion concentration at pH 4 as compared to pH 7? So again, it's remember when you go from pH 7 to pH 6, so you're going more acidic, the proton concentration jumps by 10, but what was the hydroxide ion concentration doing? As you go from pH 7 to pH 6, what is the OH minus concentration doing? That's right. Remember, they're inversely proportional. As one goes up by 10, the other goes down by 10. So the hydroxide ion concentration is dropping by 10 when you go to pH 6, and it drops by another 10 when you go to pH 5, and it drops by another 10 when you go to pH 4, right? So the correct answer would be at pH 4, you have one one thousandth, right? You have a, a thousandth of the of the hydroxide ion concentration. So you have a thousand times less uh, hydroxide ion concentration than you did at pH 7. So uh, I hope that makes sense. If not, remember in chapter 3 video, we go into great detail about this. So those are the types of questions you might see. You know, at this pH, how many times more protons do you have than at this pH? Or at this pH, how many times fewer hydroxide ions do you have than at that pH, right? So be able to think on that scale. Okay, and then remember what buffers are. Buffers are simply substances that minimize changes in pH. And then lastly, we talked about ocean acidification and how that works. And do you remember how that works? CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, combining with water to form uh, carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, as all acids do, release protons into the solution, making the solution, or the in this case, the ocean, more acidic. The proton then combines with carbonate to form this waste product called bicarbonate. And that's a problem because you don't, you know, bicarbonate isn't very useful in the ocean. Instead, the, the sea creatures, especially the shellfish and the coral reefs, they need, they need to form their, their shells, right? And the way they make their shells, remember, was by combining calcium and carbonate to form calcium carbonate to form their shells. Well, that, that carbonate is being depleted by the protons, right, by, by ocean acidification. So this is how ocean acidification works. All right, and that's it, you guys. I hope that was a good review. Again, if anything in the review was uh, confusing or you need more detail, remember you have the full-length lecture videos which go into more detail. The, the purpose of the exam review is just to get you thinking about possible questions that might pop up that you need to address. But, uh, you know, go in, re uh, read your book if you're confused about a particular topic. Look into the full-length lecture video for more details. You know, um, work in study groups. Do your best. I know you can do it. Study hard. Remember my eight checkmark method. If you don't remember the eight checkmark method to studying hard and doing well, I'll post it in a card right above my head right now. You can click on that. I, I do recommend that video right, uh, right above my head. Um, because that is my best tips on how to study as a science student. So I really recommend my study video, how to ace college, how to, how to do well at school. Please study hard. You know, uh, in science classes, you have to study hard. You have to go over your notes. And remember, how do you know you're ready for the exam? That's when you can explain everything to a friend, right? So if I can explain, for example, why water is polar to my friend from beginning to end, using uh, tons of detail. That's how I know that I mastered the material and I'm ready for the exam, okay? So I really hope this stuff helped. I wish you the best, you know, study hard, do your best, and you know, you'll, you'll uh, surprise yourself with how well you do. Uh, okay, again, good luck, and I will see you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. 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 A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.